there, Cosmic Claire at Waking the Monkey on Twitter. Now, it takes quite a lot to trigger me these days, but I got a little bit triggered today, and uh, there was an episode similar to this earlier in the year, and it's a very difficult thing to talk about, but uh, if I don't talk about it now, I'll probably not talk about it at all, because the other one, I left it when I saw... Basically, it's a matter of the way that uh, theatre is being presented these days. Um, earlier in the year, I um, went to see the uh, rock opera by um, Pete Townsend and the Who uh, called Tommy, which was a big one back in the early 70s, and I remember uh, the tunes. And um, there was some uh, cultural Marxism in that that rather... Um, I didn't like and I thought it was um, misleading and then again tonight uh, today this afternoon I've just been to see the Lion the Witch and the Wardrobe um, at uh, the Yorkshire Playhouse both of them were at the Yorkshire Playhouse it's a good theatre um, it's got good facilities um, um, but the thing is both Tommy and the Lion the Witch and the Wardrobe are um, what you might call classic um, British or English even mythologies, um, both set in the immediate post-war era. Tommy um, was born um, during the war and he grew up in the immediate post-war period um, so that he was coming of age in the time of the, um, the Who themselves in the late 60s. Um, and the other one, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, I grew up with The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Uh, I was introduced to it by my uh, headmistress who read it as a bedtime story at my boarding school in the summer term of 1962, which is 55 years ago. And the book had been only out for 11 years at the time. And both of these are classic stories which uh, the post-war generations grew up with um, really something to identify with um, something to represent the culture that uh, they were born into and which had the various uh, nuances of that era both uh, stories strongly influenced by the Second World War and um, this is something which is the the race memory of the uh, Second World War and the period afterwards. Uh, well, the race the race memory of the Second World War particularly is something which I think is particularly special and unique to uh, the British people who had um, whose ancestors lived through this. The the British the the Welsh and the, the Northern Irish and of course um, C.S. Lewis although he spent most of his life in Oxford um, was an Ulster man um, so uh, but he very much was the kind of Ulster person who bought into the whole British identity thing and um, anyway I don't know what he would have thought today because uh, first of all in in Tommy, um, it had the Tommy, because in Tommy, the story um, of the deaf, dumb, blind kid, he was born during the war and uh, his father was a uh, fighter pilot. And then in the Tommy version that I saw earlier this year, uh, the mother <coughs> was West Indian and the child was of mixed race, which is something that really wasn't part of the original story and we see this happening every time and if a West Indian company wanted to put on a version of Tommy I don't think I'd have a problem with with that sort of thing happening but this is the West Yorkshire Playhouse which is, well it's supposed to represent West Yorkshire I suppose um, but also the country and um, in the the, the the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, which I saw this afternoon at a Saturday matinee, 
there were lots and lots of children there and this is a uh, Obviously, you'd expect it. A, a classic children's story, Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, you know, has kind of story around Christmas. And um, it's all, you know, it's a great Christmassy kind of, you know, pantomime kind of tale. Um, but it's a bit more serious than your average pantomime because obviously C.S. Lewis is quite strong kind of um, spiritual message in there. But also it's not just... Uh, I mean, you know, I didn't even realise. I mean, I'd been reading, I'd read C.S. Lewis for many years before I even realised there was a Christian thing in there. But what I think is so special about um, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe is that it's actually not just Christian. It's actually a conflation of the three basic influences which make up European civilization. It um, there's, there's Teutonic elements... Um, from the northern um, peoples. There's uh, Greco-Roman elements uh, like Mr. Tomnus. Um, and um, there is the Christian element, uh, which Aslan uh, represents. And I, I think this is really, I think this is one of the really big successful things about um, Lewis. Although Tolkien, who I'm also a big fan of, um, didn't, really like the fact that uh, C.S. Lewis was conflating these different um, mythologies but I think uh, he did a very well obviously it was successful because uh, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and Narnia is you know one of the most successful children's um, series that's um, ever been published um, but it does it brings together the the three major influences which have created um, Western um, civilization and I think that is a uh, really one of the one of the big kind of success points particularly about the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and so I I just I had just hoped that there wouldn't be the kind of political correctness that we saw with uh, Tommy earlier this year and unfortunately it was the case and as you can guess what I'm going to say, some of the actors were not English. Um, now, let me be quite clear about this. The story of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe is set uh, during the evacuation um, period of uh, probably um, supposed to be around about 1940, spring 1940 or whatever, when the evacuation was happening. The children were evacuated out. So um, they were evacuated uh, out from London is the um, kind of... Uh, idea in the book and the children all had broad Yorkshire accents and a little bit more like the Burnley accent I remember from when I went over there uh, which is Lancashire but anyway these are minor little things perhaps um, because of the fact that when the four children the Pevensies Peter, Lucy, uh, Susan and Edmund um, came on only Peter was um English and of course Peter is the he's the kind of boring responsible one um that has to uh, remind you know the other children to do the sensible things uh in the in the Narnia stories um and and I'm sorry to have to say this but I really I was just I was just so I was just so disappointed to see that the producers and the directors had just gone for the so predictable and so obvious um, having non-white children as the Pevensey children now that this is this you know the, the this is just a historical um out, something out of place. Um, I, I, there's a word I should remember for that. Um, uh, it's like an anachronism. Basically, they, these children shouldn't have been there. This is, and you might say, well, why, why does it matter? Why does it matter there will be, you know, West Indian children who see this? Well, there were almost whole audience was white, a whole English um, audience, and there were a few you know, Asian and West Indian people there, and I don't begrudge them coming to see a thing like this. But the thing is that 
I feel very, very strongly that this is ours. This belongs. This is a race myth. This is a, a Northern European people's thing. And if others want to come along and enjoy watching it, all well and good. But this is ours in a way that people who have ancestries from different parts of the world, they cannot, I don't believe that they can really fully relate to this. They don't have it in their blood, literally. They don't have it in their blood, or at least they d it's diluted in their blood. And I feel very kind of sad talking about this because the children who were used for this probably don't have any idea about the cultural Marxist agenda and the Kalergi plan, which is, you know, um, using them to indoctrinate the mostly English children who will be coming to see that um, and making them think, to mislead them, to have them thinking that um, there were you know, mixed race families during the war. And, and there simply weren't. I mean, you know, there might have been one or two, but I mean, um, this is not representative of our culture from that period. And there, it's being deliberately misrepresented. This is the point. You know, you might say, well, who cares? But the point is, this is a, this is a seminal moment in our history, um, the evacuation. Um, in 1940, and uh, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe is, is one of the seminal books of uh, the culture that arose from that. And, um, frankly, this culture that was ours, it, it's being taken from us. Uh, it's being misrepresented. It's like when the um, there was that uh, thing on the uh, BBC, um, I believe, uh, earlier this year. I didn't watch it because um, I don't have a TV licence and I don't watch the BBC because I think it's trash, it's lies and it's misrepresentation. They misrepresented a Queen of France, one of the Queens of France from about her 1400 or the 14th century or so, um, and they had her played by a black actress. Now, this is just a complete... Uh, uh, anachronism, it's just completely out of place. Uh, and again, everybody, whenever this happens, people will say, but why does it matter? It's racist to uh, think about the race of the actor or, you know, who they're representing because, you know, we all bleed the same. But the thing is, they have completely different ancestries. They have completely different cultures. If you had a white French person or a Nordic person playing in a film, playing, you know, um, the family of Chaka Zulu, Chaka Zulu's wife. Oh, well, we just, you know, we just found the right actress and she just happened to be Swedish, blonde, you know, because, hey, you know, we just thought we'd like to, you know, mix up that South, uh, Southern African uh, cultural um, thing a little bit and uh, give them a bit of multiculturalism. No, it wouldn't happen. If they started putting white people into uh, the story of Chaka Zulu, you know, from 200 years ago or whatever it was, 150 years ago, um, the black peoples of Africa and throughout the world, the, the African diaspora, they'd be complaining, they'd be saying, Chaka Zulu and all his people and all his family and all his tribe were black and they were Zulus. Yeah, great, and I think that they should stay that way, and I think that's how they should be represented. So can we please have our own stories and our own histories and our own people represented by people of our own kin, you know? Um, it, it's just utterly... Um, it, it's just utterly ludicrous, and it's it's all about trying to indoctrinate. I mean, there's lots of little things in the, um, it's like, um, all the, all the little, all the little Narnian talking animals, almost all of them were white English, but then they kept on talking about how these children were going to be enthroned in Care Paravel and rule over Narnia. And there was even one bit that really 
was very, very weird indeed, because there's the bit where the White Witch says to Edmund, Oh, Edmund, I haven't got any children, but if you come with me back to my castle, you can reign after me and you can be my inheritor. And of course, Edmund is is black. So this is like what's going on with Merkel and the Kalergi plan and all this, who, when they are... The, there's this whole thing about how the birth rate of Europeans has been, you know, deliberately suppressed through economic measures, amongst other things. Um, and uh, and now they're, they're slipping this in and saying, yes, you know, yes, these people, they will be kings over us. We'll still be the little peasants like, you know, the beavers and the squirrels and stuff, you know. Uh, you can still be that, um, but... The rulers, the kings and queens of Narnia, will be people from foreign lands, basically, who are not Northern Europeans. And yet, you know, this uh, this is completely against what it completely perverts the meaning of what Aslan uh, of what uh, uh, C.S. Lewis um, meant about uh, Narnia, because every land in Narnia had a different people. Uh, the Narnians uh, were originally ruled by an English. Cabby and his wife, who found his found their way across into Narnia, and then uh, south of there, there was a place called Arkenland, which was a little bit like, you know, kind of France or or um, uh, Charlemagne's land. And then below that, not the south of that, there was a desert, and then there was the Kalorman um, kingdom, um, which was kind of a bit like Turkey or uh, something Islamic or whatever, and there's a whole lot of stuff about that. But the point is, they don't really come into it very much, and they're only judged, and they're only, you know, kind of um, made to be villains when they do bad things to Narnia. Otherwise, they can just carry on having their place down there in the south, and we don't mind. And there's even the suggestion that further south, there are, like, you know, African peoples uh, in the very southern lands to the south of uh, Narnia, and uh, that's all fine. That's all fine, you know. It's just that Aslan is the god of Narnia, and Narnia is the place in the north. Narnia is the land in the north, which has all the, you know, wonderful kind of talking trees and the spiritual landscape and the talking uh, animals and stuff like that. And that's where Aslan um, is the is the is the spiritual king, the god of Narnia, and. Um, there was a funny thing about this, really, which is kind of a bit. Mm, borderline uh fortunately aslan was brilliantly realized i mean i will say this the 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 scenery and the costumes were very well done and aslan was very very nicely done and fortunately aslan was a northern european person and it was quite interesting that uh he was portrayed by an irishman who uh, had spoke with a very irish accent now i there was lots of irish music um, all the verses were put to uh, Irish kind of Celtic kind of music, which I thought was kind of quite interesting. Um, I didn't really mind it because they, I don't know whether they even realised that uh, C.S. Lewis was an Ulster man uh, from Belfast. So, uh, you know, Irish music is, is, is quite all right. Although Narnia is normally kind of thought of in a kind of very English um, kind of, uh, you know, Wind in the Willows kind of uh, world. Um, so I thought that there was just there was just the kind of the hint that um, the you know that the um, the, the, the the English were kind of dwindled down to a kind of rustic folk you know like the the beavers and the the squirrels and uh, all all the high stuff was either the foreigners because the children you know they were half West Indian or something like that three of them. Um, and um, the, uh, you know, all the English people before they, um, uh, you know, get to the house in the country, all the um, evacuee supervisors and stuff, they're all snooty English people, you know. So um, it's kind of de rigueur these days, basically, that uh, basically uh, white English people particularly, uh, but just only white British people are, are kind of portrayed in this slightly demeaning light, um, you know, as if we're somehow kind of laughable and silly and, uh, you know, the sensible other people will come along, you know, and uh, those sensible other people will be from foreign lands or, at best, you know, from, uh, you know, from Ireland. Um, 
So generally speaking, I found this, it really, at times, it really upset me. I mean, it was, in t at other times, it was quite moving, and it was, it was a very nicely realised production, and I, I did enjoy quite a lot of it. Um, but just having that slipped in right at the beginning, and I, I just, I kind of tried to protect myself from thinking about this, but... It's just, you know, and I know people will, yes, I'll come back to this again. People will say, why, why does it matter? Why does it matter? And I'll tell you why it matters. I'll tell you why it matters. It matters because Narnia belongs to us. It's ours and they're giving it away to other people who don't have, they don't have the Jungian memory. They don't have the race memory. It's not embedded in them. And they want this to be something that, you know... Australian Aborigines can just identify with Narnia just as much as someone, you know, who grew up in the Sussex countryside. And uh, it's basically trying to make us feel bad or that we don't have an identity. You know, and maybe not even that we feel bad about ourselves, but just that we don't have an identity. You know, anybody can be English. Uh, you know, you might have seen that uh, video with Lauren Southern. Um few weeks ago where she was talking to people on the street in East End of London and they're saying yeah anybody can be British you just need a British passport and uh, you know there's a lot about this I could talk about in another video um, but anyway I've probably talked about this long enough so Narnia belongs to us and uh, C.S. Lewis belongs to us and um I'm just very, very glad that uh, Lord of the Rings, as the big movie production, was made when it was in the early 2000s, um, with, uh, before this stuff became endemic, because uh, if um, that was made now, I feel quite confident that it would be full of multiculturalism and uh, mixed races, and it would just be even worse than the... Um, you know, it was okay. There were a few bad things in it, but it was mostly good. It would just have been destroyed. The way that they're trying to destroy all of this um, stuff, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, they are the great standard bearers of uh, northern mythological British English identity uh, at a, a race myth level. They are the standard bearers. Um, and... Uh, other people can enjoy them. I don't have a problem with that. But when they are presented um, in our own lands, then they should represent the people that they were designed to, um, to tell about um, and enlighten with these myths and inform and uh, educate. So I will uh, leave that there. Please like and subscribe. Um, and uh, I will wish you all a very, very happy Yule and a very Merry Christmas as well to all the lovely northern peoples who uh, appreciate what I say. Thank you very much. Bye. I think it's particularly special and unique to uh, the British people who had, um, whose ancestors lived through this, the, the British, the the Welsh and the, the Northern Irish. And, of course, um, C.S. Lewis, although he spent most of his life in Oxford, um, was an Ulster man. Um, so, uh, but he very much was the kind of Ulster person who bought into the whole British identity thing. And um, anyway, I don't know what he would have thought today because, uh, first of all, in... In Tommy, um, it had which was a big one back in the early 70s, and I remember uh, the tunes. And um, there was some uh, cultural Marxism in that that rather um, I didn't like, and I thought it was um, misleading. And then again tonight, uh, today, this afternoon, I've just been to see The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, um, at uh, the Yorkshire Playhouse. Both of them were at the Yorkshire Playhouse. It's a good theatre. Um, it's got good facilities. Um, um, but the thing is, both Tommy and The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe are um, 
what you might call classic um, British or English even mythologies, um, both set in the immediate post-war era. Tommy um, was born um, during the war and he grew up in the immediate post-war period. Um, so that he was coming of age in the time of the um, the Who themselves in the late 60s. Um, and the other one, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I grew up with The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Uh, I was introduced to it by my uh, headmistress who read it as a bedtime story at my boarding school in the summer term of 1962, which is 55 years ago. And the book had been only out for 11 years at the time and both of these are classic stories which uh, the post-war generations grew up with um, really something to identify with um, something to represent the culture that uh, they were born into and which had the various uh, nuances of that era, both uh, stories strongly influenced by the Second World War. And um, this is something which is the the race memory of the uh, Second World War and the period afterwards. Uh, well, the race, the race memory of the Second World War particularly is something which... Hi there, Cosmic Claire at Waking the Monkey on Twitter. Now, it takes quite a lot to trigger me these days, but I got a little bit triggered today, and uh, there was an episode similar to this earlier in the year, and it's a very difficult thing to talk about, but uh, if I don't talk about it now, I'll probably not talk about it at all, because the other one I left it when I saw... Basically, it's a matter of the way that uh, theatre is being presented these days. Um, earlier in the year, I um, went to see the uh, rock opera by um, Pete Townsend and the Who uh, called Tommy.